everyone. Welcome back. Brand new Take Aim podcast and uh, happy Halloween. I hope uh, you guys have been out hunting or in a tree somewhere. The last 48 hours has been uh, really an uptick in deer movement. It's definitely what I call the start of the pre-rut. Deer are up, at least some deer, younger deer, but uh, they're up and you know some of them are bumping does and just having fun. But past 48, 48 hours have been absolutely kind of just fun, fun hunting. But Past 48 hours for this guy as well been absolutely crazy, I'm sure, with the amount of text and, and phone calls he's been getting. But Mark Lester from previous, you guys probably remember Mark from Jury Outdoors or Legend of the Fall TV. Mark killed a 211-inch giant massive. When I say massive, I mean massive, typical frame deer in Iowa just 48 hours ago. So excited for you guys to hear the story. Just amazing you know, what uh, Mark did here, he got permission on a certain farm, ended up uh, getting a shot on that deer last year, and it didn't go, you know, the way he wanted, but 48 hours ago, it ended exactly how he wanted it to, and just amazing story for this deer named Zeus, 211 inches, people, can't wait for you guys to see the pictures and what this deer looks like, and just uh, thanks to Mark for great story and great conversation today, and uh, Mark's wealth of knowledge when it comes to hunting big deer, so... As always, hope you guys enjoy the show. All right, guys, we are live. Brand new Take Game podcast. Excited to get back. And, uh, man, we're a day away from Halloween. It's almost sweet November. And uh, the past 48 hours have been absolutely crazy, I'm sure, for this guy, Mark Luster. Mark, what's happening? How's it going? Good, man. Uh, a lot of the diehards like myself probably remember Mark all the way back to the jury days. Shot a great buck called Dozier. And then Mark went on to Legends of the Fall. Mark, you shot a big, was maybe at the time your biggest typical with them. Right on film? Uh, yes. Yep. Yeah. yeah 187 inch typical. Yeah, which I remember very well. But man, uh, what a couple crazy days for you, Mark. You just uh, blew up your your biggest typical with your next biggest typical, and uh, I'm excited to talk about this deer. Oh man, yeah. It's a uh, it's been a two year quest, and um, not many <laughs> not many people could say they shot a world class deer twice, but it, it happened. <laughs> No, that's why the story is so amazing. And uh, so it's really funny. A year ago, around the same time, maybe it was in November, I think. It was, yeah. I I read a post. You were sitting there, and I think there was a picture of you and some Crown Royal, right? Was it Crown? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) it's uh, it's Crown. And uh, so I, I read the post, and, you know, like all of us, you know, somebody hits a deer and you don't find it or you're worried about it, you know, it's just that's I mean, I totally relate to wanting to, you know, I would be busting in some Captain Morgan white rum, but nonetheless, <laughs> <laughs> I'd be doing it. Yeah. So I remember I that post vividly, and then 48 hours ago, I seen you with that cup, and I actually didn't read the post correctly, and I was like, oh my gosh, did did he uh, do it again or whatever? It took me a second. I had to reread the post. And uh, I was just like, how crazy is that? Just ironically through Facebook that I caught both those posts and you did the exact same thing with the same deer. Same deer, yep. November 15th, uh, if I remember right, last year, I had this deer come in following a doe. There was three other bucks with him, and um, he was leading the way. But the doe, as they a lot of times do when they're being pushed, she wasn't following the script and she was kind of not on a trail and they ended up in the small little place on the downwind side of me. And she kind of stopped and she was a little bit nervous and he walked in and, and, and again, not on a trail, not on a area that I had planned for one to be. And this particular farm is just loaded with a uh, honeysuckle. If you're familiar with that and it'll overtake a timber so you you got to clear your lades pretty good. And and long story short is that that, that uh, there was a few tense moments, and I thought I had a decent hold to get an arrow through. And when I pulled the trigger, I hit 
one of those honeysuckle limbs and it kicked my arrow sideways and it hit him and it hit him actually pretty close to right, but it just, you know, there was no kinetic energy behind the knock, you know, so it, it only went in like an inch. Um, and he ran about 40 yards and stood over there and I could see the blood coming down his, uh, ribs. And I thought, Oh man, you're smoked. I got you, you know? Um, but he stood there for about five minutes and one of the other bucks went up and bumped the doe and she circled around and took off running. And then he let out a big grunt and took off running behind all of them. And I'm like, yeah, that's the last time I'm going to see you. I'm looking at the South end of a Northbound deer and it was not good because he was grunt chasing her. And I'm like, yeah, I didn't hurt him hardly at all. So that was uh, the night you probably seen the post with the crown raw. Yeah, that's exactly the night. Yeah. So, so crazy. But I want to back up a little bit, Mark. I mean, that's exactly how I wanted to start this story. But I wanted to back up and just kind of get, like, your history with this deer and what we what we knew and what we thought of them age-wise and, you know, the whole prior history and kind of how you got to that point where you're in that stand on November 15th and then, obviously, two days ago. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's kind of a funny story. You know, a lot of people, and, I, and I've, I've had it over the, the years, being on a show and so on and so forth. There's a lot of people get on, you know, the internet whenever you kill a big deer or whatever, and they're like, well, yeah, but that's what happens when you lease 5,000 acres or you own 5,000 acres or whatever. I mean, I want everybody to know this is a basically a 100-acre farm that is completely knock on permission ground that there were two other active people hunting on that same farm that are not on the same program as me. You know, I mean, I wow. was, it was, it, uh, he was, he was getting an immense amount of pressure from other people in there. I mean, I'm ultra conservative on the way I hunt. So I just like to bounce in on the edges of their core. I want to leave their core alone. And I just try to hunt the pinches where they're coming to and from their area and I want to come in the timber just as little as I can and get in the pinch where I where I can hunt him and then leave that core to let him be you know I I mean a deer that doesn't know he's being hunted is a is a much easier deer to kill than a deer that knows he's being hunted you know when you're punching in there and you know he knows that you've been there it's it's just it's just not a good situation so I'll I've got these other two guys constantly in there. And then I had an outfitter lease up the ground on the two sides of it because he knew the deer was in there too. I mean, and, and, and he wasn't hunting anybody else on that farm. He was hunting it himself. It was a deer he wanted. So, I mean, with all of that, this deer created quite a stir. And there was a lot of people that were actively trying to, to kill it. Um, but I, I had actually only been on that farm last year and this year. I went and knocked on a door. I, I literally got on the GIS or whatever you guys' local thing is, Beacon Maps, whatever, and was looking at aerials. And it's like, man, that farm looks pretty good, you know. And I found the landowner, went up, knocked on the door, introduced myself as, you know, a correctional lieutenant over in Illinois, but I lived here in Iowa. And, you know, just me and my son was looking for a place to hunt, and he said, well, I've got a cop that hunts behind my farm, you know, here, but uh, I've got this piece up there that you could hunt on. And um, I went up and looked it over and looked on the aerials and picked a couple of spots that I felt like was, was, was tight pinches and hung my stands and seen a ton of other stands on there. So then I found out who it was and that was also in there hunting and talked to them or whatever and told them, you know, I was trying to coordinate with them as well. And it was all fine and dandy. I mean, everything was pretty kosher. You know, we were not that we wasn't getting along or anything, but we actually were getting along well. Um, But then this big deer showed up and you know how people are when big deer get involved, they all of a sudden aren't nearly as friendly as they used to be. So, um, then I'm getting him walking in front of my cameras and making faces at it, and just it was it was uh, it was a struggle, man. Oh, <laughs> you know, no I, and I can't tell you how happy I am to, to to close the chapter on the second opportunity. Wow, that's crazy, Mark. So last year when you got permission on this other piece of farmer let you on, what right, which which things right away 
said to you, you know, like this pretty decent farm and these are spots that I would hunt? Well, I, it's kind of funny. I, I put up cameras on a couple of different fence gaps where they was leaving this timber CRP area, and there's a little fence gap leading out into fields, and I put cameras on it. And um, pretty much immediately I started getting several really, really big deer on the farm. Um, and, and that particular farm, I, I, I named them all Greek gods, you know. So I had Apollo, Hades. Zeus, um, and Poseidon, well, Poseidon was a huge mass of 10 with a couple of kickers that once he shed velvet disappeared. Apollo was still on the farm, but he was super old, and he's going downhill. Um, Hades, a guy from Florida, showed up last year and shot in the shoulder and has not been seen since. Um, and then Zeus, I actually you know, again, shot and, and lost, but there was pictures showed up immediately and they were on there. Hades and Zeus were the two big boys and they stayed together pretty much all summer, but until they shed velvet and then they, you know, started not liking each other <laughs> apparently, but, right. um, they, uh, they, they were kind of all over the farm, um, seemingly, pretty tight to just that particular farm popping off there just a little bit going out to fields at night but for the most part right on that farm so i knew i'd pick i mean i i I had the deer picked that i was after that was the deer i wanted you know and um i'm quite certain you know how it is to try to hunt a particular deer but i know it's it's really uh, hard <laughs> it it makes it it yeah, makes it pretty tough know. when all others get passed, you know. Yeah, for sure. So last year when you first ended up seeing Zeus, what was he? Because I mean, we we know which we'll talk about in the podcast here later what he ended up being. But what do you think last year what he was? Was he a mainframe ten as well? Did he have those kickers uh, he, last year? He had, yeah. He he was a mainframe ten, big 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 frame. 10 he had the the matching kickers on his g2s and he had that double brow or whatever as well and he had that little i don't even want to call it a drop time but it's a little flyer out there kind of out on the end of his right main beam i mean he had all of the same times that he has today except he he grew a g5 on that left side this year okay and that's and he was go ahead sorry mark he he was a giant then too. I mean, I he got maybe a little bit bigger this year, um, but he was pretty. He he wasn't far off of what he is today. Yeah, that's crazy. You know what's so unique about him this year too? It, and you said maybe getting bigger, or maybe got a little bigger this year. Is it is that deer carries that mass all the way through each tine vertically, which is oh, you know, yes. As a matter, as a matter of fact, I was holding him today. Uh, this morning, and my, my buddy was 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 beside me, and he was like, "My gosh, look at the mass on those tines, you know." And I, so I pulled out the soft tape and just just wrapped it around the the G three, you know. Um, and it was four and two eighths uh, oh. is the circumference measurement on the G three going up. I mean, it is what a legit four year old bases are. Right, and that's his. It's his time to circumference. It's it's not often you walk up on a deer and they are actually bigger than you thought when you thought it was a giant anyway. But that's literally what happened with this one. Yeah, that is so crazy. And before I get off too crazy on a tangent, Mark, but what what did you think that deer was this year? Six or seven? I assume he's six years old. Yeah, and that's. Because I don't have more than a two-year history with him, um, I, I'm certain he was at least five and a half last year. So he just exuded, you know, he had the big full body, the big neck, the broad head, the, you know, the the massive rack. He had that pretty sick mass, too. You know, I mean, he, he was certainly at least five last year. So I think he's minimum six and a half. I actually got his teeth. We're going to send it in and try to find out. Um, oh, very cool. Be so, because, because, yeah, and I'll, I'll definitely follow up with you. 
but I, 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 I'm for certain he's at least six and a half this year. Wow. Yeah, that's awesome. So you ended up getting photos of him in velvet last year and blah, blah, blah. Uh, throughout the fall, Mark, did you kind of get to put together some of that puzzle, you know, based on trail cameras of like, man, he lives here and he's using, you know, th- these trails on this wind and how much of that kind of correlated to this year? Um, yes. I, well, and you know what's funny, too, is, you know, how, I, I mean, I think we are as humans, too. I think deer are the same way. As they get older, their core kind of shrinks, you know. As I'm, a, as I'm a younger man, I kind of bounce all around the country, but as you get older, you kind of stick a little more close to home and don't do nearly as much stuff and so on and so forth. And I, I think deer are a lot that same way. Um, but I have found that once they get to be six, seven, eight, they tend to walk more daylight. So, and I was hoping that that was the case. And I have my theories as to why that is. Um, but that's probably for a whole nother, <laughs> for a whole nother day. But I think they can't hold a doe anymore. You know, back when we're, you know, 25, 30 years old and we feel like we can rope the moon and do whatever, you know, we, have stamina for days we can run and run miles and do all the things that we have to and take very little rest and we're right back at it but as we get older you know we're not nearly as as active that's a, um, that is a good theory that, that, mark I, i've literally uh i know that that age group does get on their feet a lot more often and i just always thought it was because of it's like hey i i made it like i lived to five six seven i'm just I know I can get up and kind of walk around. I'm still alive. I just thought it was more of a habitual comfort thing, but that's a really good thought. Well, I I think I'll, I'll tell you, here's my theory. And, and it's kind of funny because I mean, the guy that kind of taught me, um, big buck hunting, we're going to call it. And it's, it's funny because I think some of the best hunters in the country are people you don't, you've never heard of, you know, yeah, yeah, and where I, where I, where I, where I grew up, there's a guy by the name of Mike Cobble, and I mean anybody that knows me will 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 have heard this a million times. He just is one of those guys that just he just he just thinks like a big deer. It's it's, it's amazing to me, um, and and I still to this day call him when I've got one that's 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 got me puzzled and so on and so forth. You know, I just I value his information that much. You know, but anyway. Um, he uh, he had a deer on his farm that, uh, well, you know, he had sheds from five, six, seven, eight, and then he, his son ended up killing him at eight and a half. It's a 238-inch deer. I think it was on cover of North American Whitetail and all of that stuff. But I, it was he killed the same year that I killed Dozer, and Dozer was eight as well. Um, that being said, we kind of got to track their history. And at four and five and six, you really didn't. You really didn't see any kind of daylight activities. Um, and then, but as six rolled around and seven and eight, they started moving more and more during daylight. Well, long story short is, is that when that deer hit eight years old, right before that shotgun season hit for Illinois, um, he had seen that deer, I think it was 17 times out of a tree stand up to that point. He was just daylight walking all over. And he sent me a text. He said, well, he said, I'm not going to see him again uh, for three or four days because the deer had a doe. He was with a doe when he went past him. um, And he's like, he's going to lock down with her, and this is going to be done for a minute. Um, So I'm like, well, dang. Well, next thing you know, a few hours later, he's like, you're not going to believe this. I just watched a 140-inch four-year-old just flat stand down that deer. A 238-inch deer. He's like, he didn't even want to fight him. You know, he came in and just took that doe from him. Well, it, like, sent off a light bulb. I'm like, well, that's why we see him during daylight all the time. He's an old man. He might have the biggest rack he's got of his life, but he can't fight that prime fighting age, 30-year-old, you know, type type human. You know, I mean, right. we're not – I'm the, I'm 47 almost years old. I'm not. 
I'm not going to turn around and, and uh, fight a 25 year old guy. I mean, he's going to beat me to a pulp. You know, I, I'm not, I'm not that young man anymore. Um, that being said, I think it's the same way with these deer. I, he, he, he knows that he's, he's been the man, you know, he's been the man for a long time and, and he, but now he can't, he don't have the body to fight these prime age, young fighting shape bucks. So they, they get knocked off a doe and then bam, they're right back on their feet and they're back looking again. I th- I, I'm, I'm convinced that that's why these seven and eight year old bucks are walking around during daylight all the time. They can no longer keep a doe off a four year old. That makes a lot of sense. So they're basically up and moving in search for one that they can, you know, kind of take away somewhere with the minimal amount of effort, so to speak. You know, it's kind of like, hey, yeah, we have energy right now. I'm going to get up. doesn't matter what time of day or night it is. I'm going to get up and do this and and see if we can find us a hot dough before, you know, like you said, a 140, 50-inch four-year-old comes by. Right, yeah, and then, and, and, then if he, and then if he gets her, you know, he might only have her for a little bit, and then if a 140 or 50-inch buck that's on the move finds him, he'll just he'll just back him off of that doe, and then all of a sudden he's back off of a doe, and he's back looking. He's he back don't, he don't, yeah. He's back up and moving. That's why I think you see him so much more during daylight at this time, uh, you know, when they get to be that age. I mean, that's that's my theory. I could be completely wrong. It's just observed things that I've seen over the years. It's it's my theory. Until um, somebody could prove me different, I'm, I'm pretty You're convinced that that's it. the reason. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, if you've seen it, you know, that's something that makes you really kind of put the puzzles together. And, you know, that's something I've never seen before. So just hearing you talk about it, it, it makes total sense to me. And that's uh, – that's a really unique thing to learn, you know, and to hear about. So with that being said, though, Mark, going back to Zeus, we were, uh, I know we got off a little bit, but that was Yeah, great. I'm sorry. That No, but that was great, though. But uh, so from last year to this year, some of that puzzle you put together, you know, trail camera wise and some of his his movements and just his life and how he lived on that farm, what did you notice? last year that you were kind of looking forward to this year that kind of said like, I'm going to go a B and C for my game plan. Right. Well, he they're on this particular farm. Like I said, it's a little timber block. It's got a bunch of fingers sticking out of it. And there were several little small two to six, seven, eight acre CRP patches that, that were in and around it. Well, um, last year, this buck tended to stick to the South end of it. And, and, and two particular, crp patches and i i was pretty certain that he bedded up on the north tip right where they kind of came to a point and met the timber it's pretty thick in there and from the trail cameras i was pretty certain i'd you know within a hundred yards or so i had his bed bedding area fairly you know pinpointed i thought um and then from like where i ended up inevitably ended up killing him there there was uh it was basically off the inside corner one of those uh crp patches but this year the landowner mowed all of the crp little coves on the east side of the timber and left the two on the south end which ironically the two on the south end was where he was basically bedding on the north tip of the of the south two crp patches so I was like, okay, well, this year I can actually get in there and not fear that he can downwind me on the east side in those CRP patches that are still standing because he mowed them all. So I was like, this is going to work out perfect. So my son and I went in. We hung a stand um, on this timbered finger where basically two CRP patches go from outside corner to outside corner, and they neck it down to about 70 or 80 yards wide in there where all of that timber is. So from field to field was only 70 or 80 yards wide. Um, and then there's this timber ridge, you know, that, that runs through the, between the two. And the one that was to the south and west was the, was the standing ones. Well, when the neighbor picked the beans, the landowner went in there and mowed up his bedding area. And that was about October 10th, maybe. 
maybe maybe a little bit after that and and I was getting daily pictures to zero pictures oh, of him. You gotta be kidding me. And and I'm like, oh no, you know, I mean my whole game plan was ruined, you know, and I, I'm like, oh no, now now the whole game's changed here and I, I need to it kinda had me reeling a little bit. Well, ironically is the guy that um was on the farm as well. One of the, the main other guy that was hunting in a, on that farm sent me a message and said, I had Zeus at 57 yards this morning. I had him at 75 the day before, whatever he's moved North. So, and, and about as I hate to say it, that information was his demise <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because I, I, you know, saying that the guy wasn't lying or fibbing or, you know, whatever, um, that, that gave me a wealth of information. So the first time I got a good Southwest, West Southwest wind when it was right, I went to that stand. My son and I had hung thinking that if that's the case, he's going to be through here. And, uh, my very first sit in there, uh, I killed, I got to kill him. Wow. So that, uh, that set right there, Mark, was that a morning or evening set? It was a morning set. I shot him about 8.45 in the morning on the 28th. So that's 7.45 here. So you're pretty close right after daylight then, I take it. Yeah, maybe, uh, yeah, like, like uh, well, I mean, it's, I think, what? yeah, about an hour, about an hour uh, and 15 minutes after daylight, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, he, I'd, I'd had a doe and fawn come through and they, they come all that particular area. There's, there's a, that ridge comes to a point in the timber. So there's basically two creeks that wide together into one right there. And the, the, what sets between the two creeks is a ridge and it comes to a point right there Well, they come down that ridge and then they dump down the creek, hop up on my side and walk right past us in that funnel. Well, the doe and fawn, a doe and fawn had done that and then few minutes later, I looked up on the ridge, and I could see a big buck walking. I pulled up the binoculars, and immediately, there's just not a whole lot of deer that size walking around, you know, and I could see the kicker off his G2. I knew immediately what deer it was, and I thought, okay, he's going to follow the same path this doe and fawn did. Um, well, when he got to where the doe and fawn dumped off the side of the ridge and came over on my side, he actually headed west. He, he was heading the wrong direction. So I pulled out my grunt call and kind of grunted at him, and he looked up and he looked my way, um, flicked his tail, and then kept on going his business the way he was headed. So I reached behind me, I grabbed the rattling antlers, and I hit them antlers together, and he come off the side of that hill at an absolute dead run. He just bulldozed down the hill, crossed the creek, and, I mean, he was 40 yards standing looking up the ridge, my way and I'm still standing there with the antlers in my hand and I'm like oh no and I had to really very slowly get those antlers hung back up and grab my bow well whenever he ducked his head down to go under one of those big autumn olive bushes and it blocked his head and everything I grabbed my bow clipped on came to full draw and he's walking he's he's headed straight at me at full speed and walking um, comes up the hill and he hit that trail where that doe and fawn had walked by and went north. Soon as he did it, his head went down, smelled the ground. He turned to the left, which was to my right, and started walking. And then that kind of put him slightly quartered away. Um, so I stopped him. And when I stopped him, he threw up his head and looked my way. And I'm, I always have to, I have to dummy proof myself because I've messed up so many times in so many ways that, I just have a a system that I go through, and I always tell myself, well, especially on a big one, don't pull, you know, don't punch the trigger, don't punch the trigger. So I just I make certain that I squeeze my way through the trigger. Well, as I'm doing that, right as I release the trigger, that deer took a step. I mean, he started walking again. Just to, and and I hit him back, and I knew I hit him back. He was quartered away, but I hit him, you know, further back than I would have liked he ran down the hill over the little point and into that second ditch whatever and i didn't see him anymore well i sat down and messaged my son um let him know what happened 
and started packing up my stuff and I lowered my bow and um, and I immediately I'm like, I'm giving him a while. I, I, I seen blood blow out his side whenever it hit him, but I immediately, my first thought was I just liver shot him. Um, right. which, which I, you know, again, I you said he was quartering it, away from you, Mark. He, right? yeah, he was quarter, right. he was quartering away. So, so when, I was like, he, he hit that trail. Did he just kind of give up on the, the thought of the two bucks fighting, which was you? I, I think he, he just when hit, he that hit that trail, trail that doe and was like, you know what? That changed yep. my mind. Yep. Yep. Yeah, he hit okay. that scent trail, that doe when she was on that trail and it immediately 90. I mean, he turned straight sideways and, and I would say, well, maybe he was trying to circle me. But the way he went was going to be to the upwind side of where I was at. So it wasn't – that wasn't it. You know, he wasn't trying to circle my wind gotcha. at that point. He, You know, he headed straight the same way those do, that doe and fawn did on the same trail that that doe and fawn went. So I was pretty certain that that, that, that was what was going on. And at that um, point when he turned, Mark, how close was he when you actually he was, got that shot? Because you started at 40. He was, yeah, he was 25. 25, 25 yards. Okay. So you put a shot and out then, and it goes goes over the hill. He, you back out. Yep. Yep. Well, I yeah, I I put everything down, whatever, and I started to get out of the stand. And I'm not gonna lie, I I thought, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna give me and the me and the good Lord five or ten minutes together to talk here because you know you just you don't get shots that you know people say. You know, I'd love to kill a 200-inch deer. You know, I mean, that's that's like the ultimate dream of the deer hunter, you know. But a 200-inch typical is not even something that's beyond a dream. That's, yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's you crazy. know, that's not something you even say, man, I'd love to do someday because it's so ridiculous. It'd be like, yeah, man, I'd like to win $100 million in the lottery sometime. I mean, yeah, it's great to say, but it's, it's, it's not really a thought that's yeah. ever obtainable, you know. So... I, I just, you know, I, so I thought, man, and, and immediately when I seen him, I'm like, man, that, that deer is, is bigger. He's heavier. He's, he's just bigger than I thought he was. Well, anyway, um, as I'm sitting there and, and talking to the big man, I look up and I see something on the opposite ridge over there. And I'm like, man, it just moved something different than like wind moving leaves or whatever. And I pulled up the binoculars and I look over there and I seen something brown, but I couldn't see legs. I couldn't see antlers. I couldn't see, I couldn't see anything that made me feel like it was a deer. And I actually convinced myself that it wasn't. And I put the binoculars down as I was sitting there a few more minutes, I seen a head shake and I'm like, no, that was rack. And I pulled up again. And I, as soon as I pulled up the binoculars, I could see him standing up. This is approximately 15 minutes after the shot. Um, I could see him stand up, but his back end came up a lot slower than his front end, and he was kind of on the side of the hill there, and he stumbled backwards two or three steps. And then whenever he got himself righted, he was flicking his tail. And then he walked about five steps. His head was down. His ears was down. His mouth was open. And I could see my exit wound right there in the back side of the ribs clear as day um he'd walk five or six steps and flick his tail and walk five or six steps and flick his tail so i knew i didn't double lung him i mean which i knew that on the shot but this was just giving me you know reassurance that that my hit was pretty much what i thought the hit was so i then you know after he got out of sight whatever i backed down um, went out the opposite way, circled way around, and then, like, I have been on recovery 30 hours after a liver shot and ended up having to put a subsequent arrow in them. Um, so, and I've seen them dead in four hours. So I, I wasn't willing to, to, to even attempt to go in that day. So I, I waited 24 hours, and I got a buddy that I trust, that, you know, that's a good blood trailer. I'm like, listen. You and my son, you guys are on the blood trail. I'm going to have my bow just in case he's really sick or whatever, and I have to put in a, a, another arrow. I pray to God that that's not the case, but I just want to be safe, you know. So 
they they were blood trailing. We got right over there, right by where I had last seen him, where he went out of sight. And my buddy's like, man, this looks like lung blood. And no longer, and he said that, I looked up, and five yards behind him, the deer's laying there. The deer no didn't way. walk four steps past when I last seen him. I no kidding. Had that ridge been just a little bit smaller, I'd have seen him fall. And he fell on his feet and slid down the hill. So he wasn't bedded up. I mean, I, I literally was seeing the last seconds of his, of his life at that point. But – there was no way I could have risked it and, and went in and blown him out of there. You know? Right, right. So, Mark, when he went around there and you ended up seeing the flicker and then ended up, you know, physically IDing him, do you think he had just stood out of the bed like had he bedded once or yes. did he yep. just do that? You know, and I know like I've seen the lung hit or a liver hit because I've done it myself. It almost freezes them at some point to where they, you know, their body's just locking up and they can't move and they'll just stand still for, you know, 30 minutes, yeah. it seems. Uh, but well, you think when he I, actually bedded it down there? Yep, he was, yeah, he was bedded. That first time when I seen something over there, I'm convinced that I seen him lay down. Because whenever okay. I pulled up the binoculars and I was looking over there, I could see something brown, and it was like laying there. I convinced myself it was a log. But there was a few trees and stuff between us, and... I, it just was blocking his head, I'm guessing, and he was laying with his back towards me, so I didn't see any white or anything, and I convinced myself it was a log that was laying there. Um, and then whenever I seen something move, it was his head shaking. He shook his head back and forth. Well, whenever I pulled back up then, um, it was when he was standing up. I was literally watched him stand up in the binoculars. No kidding. That is so and then, amazing, and, and really, you know, I kind of want to just hit on this for a second, Mark, just as a tip to everybody listening. Like, you shoot a deer, you know, don't fumble around and get all your stuff and pack up. Like, I mean, what a just a great example, Mark. You sat there, you had your little word with God, which is great, but, you know, you, more importantly, you sat there and it gave you, even by chance, that opportunity to either hear something or see something again, and for you it was see it, and you literally – were able to go from at least A to B to where you last saw him, ID'd him, and and then we know the rest of the story is five feet away. But, you know, just don't rush after you shoot something unless you physically see it go down right in front of you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Like I said, I'd, I'd packed up my stuff and then just sat back down and was like, okay, you know, I'm going to just calm down. And, and to be quite honest with you, I mean, you know, I, and I, I hopefully nobody – has done this, but unfortunately it's, it's part of bow hunting. You know, whenever you shoot one and you're like, Oh no, you know, that's not, that's not what I wanted. You know, that's a bad yeah. shot or whatever. I mean, I, I knew it was back, but I knew it was a dead deer. And I think, I don't know if you've seen my post, but I, you know, I, I said that com well, the comment in my, my initial post, I, I made a post about me being in for the first real hunt on Zeus this year, whatever, and then down in the comments of that, I'm like, oh, my God, I just, you know, I just shot Zeus, you know. But in that comment, I said, you know, I hit him a little bit back. I'm going to give him time, but he's 100%. He's a dead deer. You know, I mean, when I pulled that trigger and where I hit him, I wasn't happy, but I kn I knew he was a dead deer. I just had to do the right things from then on and not let him, you know, being impatient, you know, make a decision for me and then me go in there and bump him up and then lose him because he's not bleeding at all. Um, you know, I knew if I just backed out, left him alone, he would bed down there and wouldn't move and we'd find him the next day. So, I mean, I, I knew that it was a lethal kill or a lethal shot. It just, I knew that, it wasn't going to be as quick as what I had hoped. Now, hindsight being 2020, I actually run it through his liver up into his lung and out um, the fourth rib forward from the back on the, on the exit side. So it was a little bit better than I thought it was, but it, you know, it just, I just wasn't willing to risk it. You don't want to risk it on any deer, but my goodness, a 200 inch typical deer is just unbelievable. So yeah, I, it, I just, yeah, I wanted crazy. to, I wanted to be ultra, ultra cautious. Yeah, I don't blame you for being conservative. And, uh, you know, there's a saying, dead is dead, you know, 
And as Bart knows, like right. it doesn't matter if if you can just exude that patience. That is dead, and it doesn't matter, you know, if it's 15 minutes or, you know, like we had talked about earlier in the podcast. You know, sometimes unfortunately a liver hit. We, there is no timetable. It can be four hours. It could be 20 hours. So, just uh, but kudos yeah. to you, Mark, for doing the right thing and just uh, you know, I'm sure that night, you know. It was probably that's when I saw your post, obviously, but just, you know, <laughs> hilarious. Like you know, it, it was probably super uh, nice to have that drink, but it probably you know didn't even help because man, you can't you can't stop your mind from racing when that happens. Yeah, I, I probably got a good solid two hours sleep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it wasn't much. It yeah. wasn't much. I but like I said, I just I I mean I I felt like. He was. It was a lethal hit. I just, I just had to, to play things right and do the thing. You know, if I if I go about this the right way, we're going to have a recovered deer. I I'm completely tickled to death that it was, you know, just a few feet from where I last seen him. It made it made for, you know, I I don't think my heart could have handled too much more uh, anticipation. I guess. Yeah, no doubt. You know, and it makes for a cool story that that. Uh you know, just how you just told it, you know, you, you saw it and four feet later there it was unbeknownst to you. So, you know, just adds to kind of that, that legacy of what is Zeus. Oh man. I, I don't know if you ever have an opportunity to get your hands on it, but it's, it's an unbelievable deer. (laughs) Yeah. It looks like it. I I mean, and, and the thing is, is I, I knew it was big, man, but I didn't realize how big it was until, Hunter and I, my son, got back to the house and we was taking care of it. And I, you know, I washed him out with the hose and cold water and, you know, taking care of him, you know, there. And I walked inside and that buck that you're talking about, that big typical, that buck I named the Facebook buck, um, it was a 187 inch typical deer. I, I walk in, it's right there by the front door when you walk in the house. Um, he looked tiny, like and I know that's crazy to say, but he looks tiny compared to the deer that was out in the back of the truck. I looked at my son. I'm like, hey, yeah, give me the soft tape. And he smiled. He said, are, are you, he said I said, are you going to do this? I'm like, look at look at Facebook. I mean, and then look outside. And then it's not even, he's not even in the same class. Close, yeah. It's not even close. I'm saying, that's crazy to me, you know. And, I, you know, in all the pictures and stuff, I... I'm not gonna lie. I mean, I I I thought he was a 190, you know, type typical with a little trash, and I was thinking that he could have eked over the 200 mark total gross. But I was not prepared for the number that his calculator said whenever it was done. And and don't get me wrong, it was a soft tape, and it was on the body, and it was kind of moving around, and it wasn't official. And whenever he got to, a matter of fact, it got to like 196 or five or whatever. And he's sitting there thinking to himself, he's telling me this story after the fact, he's like, man, he's, you know, he's really close to 200, really nice deer. And then he saw me going for the inside spread and he's like, Oh my God, he hasn't even put an inside spread in this thing. And then bam, it pops up. It's like 215. And he's like, are you kidding me? So I immediately, we got a hold of Cameron Coble. He's a buddy of mine and he's a, you know, official score for Boone and Crockett. And I'm like, eh, you might need to come do this. I, I want somebody other than me to do this. And whenever he showed up and put the tape to it and he come up with 211 and six eights or whatever and 204 and six eights, typical most typically, frame. yeah, yeah, he, he was like, my goodness, you don't know what you've done. Yeah. You don't, yeah, that's for sure. And and Cam is such a legit, uh, you know, takes the measuring so serious that uh, you know exactly what you're getting when he measures you a deer. There's no doubt. So, Ab- absolutely, yeah. and that's why I said, I mean, he has no interest in inflating a single number, and he's he's signing his name off on this. Right. You know, that's, that's right. his reputation. So that's why I was like it. If he's got it, then whatever, I know it's going to be a, a legit number. It's not going to be far from that whenever it dries and, you know, whatever. And like I said, I've I've never entered a, a deer. Um, but he's like, you, you, you have 
you have to do this. He said, you're talking about, he's like, and I don't know. He said, I need to, to research it. But if there's anybody in the world that knows deer and deer numbers and people's deer, it's, it's that guy, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, he's like a human calculator as far as that's concerned, or encyclopedia, I guess yeah, I should say. He, but He's an encyclopedia it, when it comes to deer numbers, like exactly, deer numbers, yeah. exactly what a typical is. Or a not typical gross. He knows those inside and out. Does not matter where it came from. He knows it. Yes, he knows it. And and he he's like, you know, even with all of those kickers, I can't remember. There's seven inches or something of kickers, which is all deduction. Um, he's like, I think you're like really close to 189, like 188, six eights or something like that. Net typical, even with the extra deductions, he's like, you're like number eleven in Iowa all time, you know, right. the archery. Um, he's like, you, you're going to have to enter this thing. He's yeah. like, and let me, let, he's like, let me score it when it's done because he's like, I would, I would love to score it. And I'm like, well, of course, I mean, I got you here right now. Uh, you know, you can certainly do it later. So anyway, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm still on cloud nine, man. Yeah, I don't blame you, man. Uh, you, you know, super excited for you. What a deer, like legitimately deer of a lifetime. And, uh, when I uh, get the show out today, later today, I'll post the pictures and everybody listening, make sure you check out the social media and artwork for this or media art because you won't believe what this deer really looks like. You know, we're talking about it and say it again, Mark, two eleven and six eight, like crazy, right? Typical yes, frame. It's, it's nuts. Yeah, it's nuts. It's, it's, uh, yeah, he, he's overwhelmingly typical. There's just, there's a, you yeah. know, a few little kickers there, but as a general rule, all, all you see is just a big, massive, typical rack. It's, Frame, yeah. It's an amazing deer. All the way up, yeah. Just insane amount of mass and mass all the way up the tines and, you know, just super cool features as well, but just as, as pretty as a massive, but massive typical, not one of those spindly, but a massive typical as you'll ever see. So, uh, but uh, congrats Absolutely. so much, Mark, on what a, you know, crazy deer and, you know, Zeus will be one that people will remember forever. So, amazing. Oh, I know. I certainly will. And like I said, I mean, and again, I mean, if I could reiterate one thing, you know, here, this is 100% permission ground that there's others hunting on as well as all the way around it. You know, it isn't a 6,000-acre private farm groom, you know, type thing. This is this is a deer that any single person that was hunting in Iowa could kill. I mean, no different than anybody else. No food plots, no anything. You know, this was just a it was a permission ground, you know, hunt. I mean, which was to me it makes it even that much more special, I guess. Yeah, for sure. I mean I love that part of the story and it's you know, relatable because I I'm going to you know, hunt this afternoon and all my grounds permission, you know, and it, it's just one of those things. And uh, with that said, Mark, I dream about that every day, you know, like just making it happen on some ground I got permission on that I knew somebody that knew somebody and I went and talked and got it, you know. So uh, yep. kudos to that. And I know how hard it is because, you know, uh, today I got somebody to the west of me and, you know, and I'm in Michigan, you know, it makes it hard and, you know, you can never control what anybody else is doing. All you can do is control what type of deer you shoot. That's it. That's so. That's a that's a. You said a mouthful right there. Absolutely, yeah. with one hundred percent. So that said, though, Mark, man, congrats, and uh, hopefully, uh, I know you'll be hunting again soon. But uh, we'll do this again one day. I hope. Okay. Yes, sir. All right, man. Well, thanks so much, or so much for being on, and. Uh, what a deer, and, uh, man, hopefully we get to meet up one day, me, you, and Cam have a beer, and I, I get to see that thing. Absolutely. Let's right, plan on it. Talk right, to you thanks. soon. Thanks, Mark. Yes, sir. Bye. All right, guys, as we close the show today, make sure if you have not taken advantage of using the Take Aim discount, use the code TAKEAIM10 and upgrade to the Hunt Stand Pro version of the Hunt Stand app. You won't be disappointed. Make sure to check that out. 